Listen to the Nottingham's podcast, The Money Pot. The Money Pot provides information on the world of finances, from savings accounts to mortgages and money-saving ideas. We also have discussions about planning a better future, fraud awareness, plus top tips from bloggers talking about their home buying experiences, interior inspiration, plus much more. You can listen to the Nottingham's podcast today. Join Sam and Ross from the Nottingham Building Society and become a financial master. Listen today at thenottingham.com forward slash podcast. So how are things where you are? Have you managed to get on the ice much or anything? Yeah, so actually I'm um, pretty lucky here. We've been able to, I've been on the ice since mid-July or yeah, mid-July. Um, so we were full full team for a while there. And then uh, since we're, I'm in Toronto, Mississauga, so things have spiked a little bit around here. So they've cut back on the numbers in terms of training and that kind of stuff. So we're down to 10 people max on the ice. So that's been, it's been good though. Like I'm really very fortunate that we've been able to stay on the ice and it's kind of kept me sane in my routine because you know, that couple months where we were kind of, you know, stuck at home, it was tough and I couldn't imagine having to go back. So I'm just praying that, you know, we can keep everything kind of in check here. So. What was the first skate back like? I imagine that's a, an experience. Oh, it was awesome. I felt a little bit like a robot in my gear, but um, it was, it felt good just to be around the girls. And I think that was the big thing, right? Like I continued to train on my own and kind of in my, I made my spare bedroom into a little bit of a gym, but it's not the same. A lot of the girls will tell you when you're on a team sport, it's just not the same when you're on your own. So it's been, it's been really nice to at least have a, a small group together. So. Right. So that that's the present what's happening so we're going to go back to the start i'm not going to say we're going a long way back because me and you are yeah. similar in age and i don't want to age myself so <laughs> see only the canadians laugh at that the americans didn't <laughs> canadian british humor mixes better i think absolutely <laughs> so where did ice hockey first come into your life um so i grew up uh, in ottawa ontario so my dad was a big hockey player growing up so he actually uh he played junior in markham ontario unionville so some big names that came out of there were like uh, steven sam coast um jillian apps those kind of names and he grew up uh, gr- grew up playing there so actually when i was a young kid he was at a tournament i think in niagara falls ontario and i remember i apparently i don't remember this but my mom told me that i turned to her and said can i play hockey just like my dad and the next year they signed me up and I never really looked back after that. So that's kind of the first memory I have. First memory I have is, you know, going to that kind of, um, I don't even know what they call it, like mini mites or something like that. So that was my first memory of, of hockey. And then was there anyone when you were growing up like playing, was there anyone that you looked to play like your favorites or how you tried to emulate your style around? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think I always looked up to, you know, some of the girls in the Olympic team at the time. Like I always, you know, the big names I always think of are like Jana Hefford or Carolyn Willette or, you know, those kind of types of names. Because, you know, in tw- I remember 2002 Olympics in Salt Lake City were kind of the first memory I have of watching the Olympic Games. And I remember watching uh, Canada win that game. And I remember Jana scoring a goal with like two seconds left in the second period. And that's kind of like ingrained in my mind. So, um, I kind of always looked up to those those players growing up, and uh, my favorite NHL player was Mario Lemieux. So he was my he was my guy. I was I wore actually wore sixty six growing up. Um, so he was he was my favorite player. Just you know his size, his skill. He was just so smooth and so fun to watch. And um, so that was my favorite player growing up. Well, that doesn't mean that you're a Penguins fan, does it? Well, I am. I was. I am still a Penguins fan, but uh, I, I kind of turned into a Leafs fan from growing up and from now living in Toronto. So it's, it's hard for me to say that, but uh, I have become a big Leafs fan now that I've lived here for a while. Well, given the success of the franchise, I bet you wish you just solely stuck with Pittsburgh. <laughs> I know I should stick with Pittsburgh, but it's it's kind of, it's contagious here. It's like a, it's like it's like the virus. It ca- you catch on to it as the Leafs when you live live in Toronto longer and. You just can't, you know, not talk about them and want to watch them and want them to do well. And it's funny because me and my teammates sit here and watch the games and we get frustrated, we get excited. It's, you know, it's all a bunch of emotions. And I didn't even grow up a Leafs fan, so, but I've slowly become a Leafs fan. So, being in the Toronto area, I'm going to take it away from hockey for a very, very brief second here. When the Toronto Raptors were on that incredible run in the playoffs, did, did they take over the city from the Maple Leafs at that, just for that brief period? Oh yeah, absolutely. It became a, a, a basketball city. It was so fun to be a part of. And I actually remember, um, I was actually downtown uh, at Jack Astor's during the Kawhi shot when he, 
when they won the second round, I believe. I, I will tell you. I will tell you this. I'm a 76ers fan, so bringing that up is breaking oh. my heart. So <laughs> great to hear that. Continue. But I I remember sitting there. I was at the bar side, and I was sitting with a couple of my friends, and I remember just you could hear almost hear the whole city just like erupt, and I that memory will forever be ingrained in my head. And um, I actually remember too. I was actually ended up being downtown during the parade. It just happened I had something downtown, and after what I, I had an, uh, an interview and after I was like, you know what, I'm just going to walk through where the parade route is just to see so I can say that I saw it. And it was absolutely phenomenal. Like just the people that were around, I, you couldn't get cell service, just the vibe in the city. And I was actually able to catch one of the, the you know, Kawhi and the guys on the bus as they went by. And I don't know, it was pretty contagious. You know, I, I've never watched so many basketball games in my life, I don't think, but it's, it's pretty cool. Like they do, it's, you know, to be in a city where, there, where things are happening and, you know, sports teams are being successful, it really is a lot of fun. Well, that, that's the thing is that like, like to, not to knock the Maple Leafs, but Toronto is a city that has been starved of success for a long time. So when something yeah. like that comes along, it will capture the imagination, like, like you said. Yeah, I can only imagine if the Leafs win. Like, I, I don't know if Toronto will exist after. I think, you know, the, the Raptors celebration was big, but if the Leafs win uh, in the next couple of years and end and that drought of a long, long time, it'll be <laughs> – uh, you'll remember where you are, that's for sure. Well, they got to avoid becoming the Dallas Cowboys of the NHL because that's where, that's where they're headed, that territory. The Cowboys are tough to watch right now. <laughs> Thankfully, again, Steelers fan, so happy about that. Yeah, my, sport, well my sports teams don't make any sense, so I, I'm not willing to get into <laughs> why I sport who I do. They don't so, have to. So when you're, when you're growing up, you kind of got into the Canadian program quite early, didn't you? Yeah, I, was, uh, I think I was 16 when I first uh, came a part of it. Is that, is that when like, the cog started turning that this could be a thing? that Because you can do it and you can play it and you can ask people like your parents. But then when you get the nod from Team Canada at like 16, that can set the, the wheels turning, I imagine. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I remember getting the first email from Mel Davidson. I'm not sure if you know who Mel Davidson is. She's a big, she was uh, the GM and head coach, uh, bit, one of the biggest names in female hockey, um, you know, ever around the world, not let alone just in Canada, but. So at the time, I received an email from her, I think, saying, you know, you, you've been invited to the, the first strength and conditioning camp or whatever. I remember being like, holy, this is, this is real. And I think uh, that's kind of when it set off the fact, like you said, that I, you know, maybe this could be a real thing and maybe something that a goal that's actually achievable. I think as a young kid, you're always like, oh, OK, I want to go to the Olympics. I want to do that. But it doesn't really become reality until it's kind of you can see it. Right. I think mm. that was kind of the first time. I was like, okay, this can be a real thing. And, you know, that's when kind of universities and that kind of thing started to become uh, a reality. Right. You mentioned universities and you ended up signing with uh, committing to Clarks. And I think that's the correct expression for it. Now, over here, I think it's very hard for us in the UK to understand how big college sports are in North America. So can you just give an overview of what that is like over there? (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. Um, So, I, especially in the U.S., I think, um, you know, Canadian university sports are starting to get bigger. Um, but in the U.S., it's huge, right? To be able to play Division One college sports or university sports in, in the U.S. is something very, very special. And um, you're right, though. I didn't really understand it either until I actually did a couple of my visits. And one visit that stuck out to me in terms of how big it is was when I, I actually visited Minnesota, uh, the Gophers. So that's a bigger, a big hockey school in terms of, you know, on the women's side. And uh, they took me to the very first game in the, in the football stadium that they had just built on campus. And I got to go to the very first game that was ever in that stadium. And, you know, now that I'm a little bit older, I can under- appreciate how amazing that, uh, that experience was. But you can, like, it's, it was incredible to see the people just filtering into the stadium for a university or a college game. And just the amount of students and people that were around and then they had won that game. And then afterwards it was just pandemonium on campus. And I remember being like, this is insane. You know, this is crazy. And um, so you could really tell how big sports is in America. And, and the reason why I did go to Clarkson is because, you know, we were, we were the only division one sport hockey, men's and women's hockey. So we were that, you know, that kind of attention that football got on that visit with Minnesota. We were that attention uh, at Clarkson, which is kind of cool to be a part of. And, still a young program that so I was able to be a part of a program that was that was building and that was going to be you know starting to get better as as I was there and you mentioned Minnesota being one of the the powerhouses of women's hockey if now this is risky territory believing everything that Wikipedia tells me but you were also (laughs) recruited by Wisconsin which is a huge organization a huge program in women's hockey you look at the Canadian national teams and things 
and they're all most of them are with you know, Wisconsin. Yeah. What What was that? Did you visit there, or did you or did you not, or did you only visit a few places? Um, unfortunately, I didn't. I didn't visit uh, Wisconsin, but I, I was. You know, I think at at that time I had kind of had to make a couple of decisions and kind of really narrow it down. But Wisconsin, the 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 whole West West Conference at that time, so Minnesota, Minnesota Duluth, and Wisconsin were typically your big three schools. And at that time, no one else had won a, a national championship in female hockey, right? So I think as a as a as a recruit, you're looking there. Okay, do I want to join these big programs and be successful right away? And that was something that I definitely thought about doing. And um, you know, I, Wisconsin, you know, you don't even have to, just like you said, the record alone is, is phenomenal there. And the girls that I play with now that have come out of that school and the program is just un- phenomenal. So, um, it, unfortunately I, I didn't visit there, but I've heard very, very good things. So when you make the commitment to Clarkson, how far away is that from home for you? So it was actually only an hour and a half. So it was very close to home. And at the time, uh, as a young kid, you don't really realize how awesome that is, right? I think, you know, as I got older and closer to my senior year, I appreciated it more because my parents were closer and I was home. I, I didn't get to go home a ton, but it was nice having them around more. And it was really awesome. And who are your big rivals at Clarkson? Uh, St. Lawrence University. So they're nine miles down the road. And uh, we had some very, very fun games against them. And uh it's funny because, you know, we kind of share the same bars, right? So as a college student, you'd kind of mix and mix and mingle with them. But on the ice, we did not like each other. That's for sure. So tell me about your first experience of a game against St. Lawrence then. Oh, gosh, I'm trying to think. So <laughs> usually, uh, usually we play St. Lawrence pretty early in the year. So we usually play them four times, at least when I was there. We played four times a year against them. And uh, I remember going into their their rink and our, our pep band sits right behind us. Um, uh, our bench uh, during those games and um, you can't even hear our coach talk right our, our pep bands go on you can't even hear them that you know the other 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 team is going crazy the fans so my first experience was like okay this is this is how college hockey works I'm not in junior anymore and it was it was super fun I remember my my all my senses were heightened I didn't know what was happening and um, we've like over the years like I said we've had some good battles against them and <laughs> some that I'm not proud of some that I'm very proud of that's for sure <laughs> So let's talk about a moment you will be proud of then. Do you remember your first college goal? Oh, gosh. Because you score a lot of goals. I I did. (laughs) Uh, It took a while. I remember, I think, uh, at least in my head, it took a while. I think it took like 11 games. And uh, at the time, I was supposed to be the one that was supposed to be scoring all the goals, I think. I do remember, I think it was more of like a relief. I (laughs) I remember, and then everyone, I remember everyone on the bench being like, okay, okay, Raddy, now you're going to go. Like, once you get one, it, you're, you're set, right? So it was a pretty cool feeling, though. Like, I, you know, um, I think once you hit that, those kind of milestones, you know, as a player, and you appreciate it more as you get older, I think. But at, at the time, you're just kind of, okay, I got one over with. Now we can kind of move on with that, with that milestone. And I imagine that the year that you look back on most fondly at Clarkson is the final one. Yeah. It kind of has to be. <laughs> Yeah, that one is pretty tough to beat in any of my career. I mean, I mean, I could talk about this for days, especially when my teammates are around. But um, I mean, that year, it's it's tough to put into words because there was so many things that happened that were just so special. And the one thing that I do remember the most is that it was just everyone was so just consistent, consistently there for each other and consistently respected what everyone brought. And that's something that um, I always say about the teams that are have recipes to win. Everyone was. Res- has knows their job everyone respects what everyone jobs everyone's job is and everyone you know brings it every single day you know right you don't have to be best friends all year you don't have to be you know you know laughing and giggling every time at the rink but as long as you're bringing your best every day and you respect the teammate beside you I think that that's the recipe for success and that's exactly what that team was and in the end it just came together all at the right time and you know especially my senior class um, after the first couple of years we had had at Clarkson where they weren't as success as successful as we wanted. We kind of put a goal in our mind saying, you know what, we're not going to let this happen again. We are here for a reason. And, you know, we kind of built a, built this culture as the years went on there that, you know, you know, that's what the team was going to be. We were going to work, work for each other. We were going to respect what everybody brought and, you know, we were going to try and put it all together. And that's exactly what happened that year. And that year you also got an A put on your chest. Now, did, was, that expect, was that expected for you? Did, did you get that out of the blue, like coach calls you in and just says? 
Um, I don't know. I think, I think, you know, by that time I, I had seen myself as a leader, I think, um, you know, especially as in a college program, as soon as you get to your fourth year, I think almost everybody is a leader in their own right and in their own way. And everyone uh, within that senior class had their own way of bringing, of, of being a leader. But I think for me, I think it was something exciting for me. It was a challenge that I really enjoyed and I wanted to make sure that my teammates knew exactly what they were going to get every day, right? It wasn't going to be a roller coaster with me in terms of when Raddy gets the rink, this is exactly what she's going to bring. And, and you, know, you know what exactly she's going to bring every single day, every practice, every game. And I think that's something that I've taken into my career now is that, you know, my teammates can, can know exactly what they're going to get from me every day. And, and that's consistency in terms of my work ethic, in terms of my attitude, in terms of everything. Um, you said that you joined Clarkson because you could sense that they were trying to build something there. It was a chance to something fresh, like a new to build a new powerhouse in women's hockey, like almost sort of thing. So yeah. to win that NCAA championship, that that's kind of like mission fulfilled, isn't it? At that point, like you've been through all the steps of it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, my first year there, uh, we set the record for the most losses. I'm pretty sure. Um, and then by the end, we had set a record for the most wins. So. That right there just tells you that we had we had built something special right there and we had taken the right steps. Yeah, you know, I, I'm a big believer in trust the process and that's exactly what had happened uh, during those four years. And it, it, it was such a fun thing to share with, especially the group of seven girls that were there for all four years because we had been through it all. We had seen, you know, kind of the basement and we had gotten to the top. And to be honest, that year, you know, we were a good, very, very good team. But I don't think everybody thought we were going to win, right? I think the only people that knew we were going to win were us, was us. And um, I remember going into the NCAA tournament being like, and the, the confidence and, you know, thing in, in the dressing room, we weren't, we weren't, no one was going to beat us. There was just that, that feeling in the air that we, we were there to win and, and uh, it didn't matter what anyone else was saying. All right. So a lot of people in the UK won't be familiar with the Frozen Four. It's very, yeah. very similar from what I understand to our playoffs in the UK elite league where you have four teams over one weekend yep. do, do or die, win or go home. Yep. Tell me about the frozen four. Yeah. So that was the first time Clarkson had ever been uh, to the frozen four. So the weekend in itself is just something, you know, I think as a, as a, especially as a hockey player, that's what you strive for in college. And that's kind of what you want to get to. Right. And um, I think at first you're like, okay, we're here, you know, that that's good, but you want to, you want to make sure that when you go there, you're not satisfied with just being there. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, the frozen four was pretty neat. You know, you have the whole weekend, you have a banquet before all the, all the fun starts and then you play Friday and Sunday. So um, Friday we went into a game against Mercyhurst where, you know, I think a lot of us were pretty nervous at first, but um, we ended up, you know, kind of getting through the first period where, you know, and then we kind of rolled, we, we finally found our game and we finally found our footing in terms of, you know, yes, we deserve to be here and, you know, we're not going to go home early. And then who did you play? Who was it you played in the final? Uh, Minnesota. Oh, so you played the, the big program that wanted to recruit you. That's extra <laughs> motivation. <laughs> yeah. So actually the cool thing about uh, that story, which kind of ties everything together in terms of my career at Clarkson was that, uh, my first ever game uh, at Clarkson was against Minnesota, actually against Megan Bozak, who you've had on, this, on the show. We actually lost uh, 5 nothing and 3 nothing the first weekend of my college career ever. And can you imagine being a freshman, so excited to just go and play, and if we're supposed to be highly recruited, and we didn't score a single goal my first weekend ever there. Here I asked what your plus minus was. Oh, probably minus six. <laughs> who knows? Probably bad. But, uh, and then skip to my last game ever, and who, who is it against? It's against Minnesota. And at that time, they were two-time defending champions. Um, so they were looking to go for three in a row. And uh, so they would have been coming off that undefeated season then? They were, yeah. So oh, they'd only wow. lost, they had only <laughs> lost two games in like 100, two out, of ga two out of 100 games or something. It was something insane. And, you know, everyone, of course, is, you know, thinking Minnesota is going to win, but... Uh, you know what what a story to you know have my first game ever be a blowout and end up beating them in the final and winning the championship was was pretty special and I think the coolest thing thing is that we kind of spoiled their parade of three in a row and um that was that was pretty fun to be a part of that's for sure but that's not just uh, the program's first championship it's the university's first championship so I imagine that for for a good while you own that campus when you get back to Clarkson <laughs> yeah um 
Yeah, like uh, it's funny because we we try to go back every year for alumni weekend. There's a handful of us that do go, and uh, <laughs> I mean we <laughs> we have a lot of fun when we go back. And you know, I think the the president president of the school who you know at a small school you get to know pretty well and he's still very thankful of, of the girls that brought that first championship because it brought a lot of awareness to the school and and now you look at the the record of the school it's pretty phenomenal and it's pretty fun as an alumni to see how big it's gotten now and you know it's you go back and you just love it because you know it's all the good memories and you know we got to we got to we got to be a part of building that program so it's really really special and that's the thing, like the, the connection you build with the college you go to, it, beca- it almost becomes home away from home, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. It's like you feel right back uh, like you're a student again. And, um, you know, you, you go back to college for a weekend and that's all I can really handle, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> after a while. So it's, you know, it is really neat to go back and, you know, they've, they've kind of built this program there now and they've just built a brand new rink and it's really, really neat to see how far it's come and, um, you meet, you see people that, you know, that were there while you were there and, you know, some of the professors, uh, the coaches, everything. And it's pretty special to my heart. It always will be. And then one of your teammates at Clarkson is an alumni of this show. Yeah. And as the general rule of thumb is that you have to tell a story, tell me about them and tell a story about them. So tell me about Renata Fast. Oh boy. Uh, I don't know. Renata is a pretty, she's pretty, uh, prim and proper. So I don't know if there's any bad, any, any, well, not bad, but any good stories of her, but. Um, well, just tell me about her then. <laughs> yeah, so uh, <laughs> some of the, you know, Renata's probably, for people who don't know, she's probably one of the best athletes I've ever seen, whether, you know, she could play any sport and be good at it. She can jump through the roof. She's uh, she's one of the fastest players on the planet, maybe the fastest in my opinion. And um, she's one of the nicest humans I've ever met. She's a great teammate. And um, I don't know, I think the cool thing about Renata is that you've seen how, how good she's gotten over the years, and I got to, a chance to play with her for two years at Clarkson, and to where she is now, and I get to train and see, see her on a weekly basis, and uh, I, I'm just really happy to see that she's just become, you know, such a phenomenal athlete, and also an ambassador of, of the game, and she deserves every, every ounce of it, because um, she works her, her tail off, and she's a great human at that, too, and um, it was really special to share a couple of years with her at Clarkson and now become a, become teammates with her on the national team is very special. So, And then to, to, to wrap up the, 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 the university part of, of your career so far, 181 points in 147 games. Now, does that still stand as leading scorer in program history? It does not, no. Oh, uh, your I know. Well, that's good, updating. <laughs> yeah, I know. But that's good, though. It's, uh, it just means the program is getting better and – uh, I'm not sure who holds the record now. It's either Lauren Gable or uh, Elizabeth Jaguer, who actually, Jaguer is still currently at Clarkson. I think she's going into her senior year. But so she's adding to her totals. <laughs> oh, she, like she is, it's pretty phenomenal what she's done her, in her career. Like as a, as a junior, she broke 200 points. She's phenomenal, phenomenal. And uh, someone like Lauren Gable, who I have a chance to play with now, and uh, you know, she broke my record probably way earlier than I did. And she, you know, it just shows that the program is really, really building and the players that want to go there now. I think that, you know, you know, it's just awesome to see as an alumni. I think records are, are meant to be broken. And, you know, I got to have that record for a while and now it's not mine anymore. And I'm OK with that. And it's especially the, the truth with off, uh, offensive stats, isn't it? As all sports go to more scoring points, more, more goals, more everything. A- any offensive stat is on the table to be broken at any point. Absolutely. And uh you know, I think uh, it's pretty special to see, like, especially when someone like Jaguer, who's currently there now, I think, you know, I went to, I saw her play last year and, you know, it's, there's no, like, there's a reason why she's broken all those records, right? She's a pretty phenomenal player and um, it just shows to go that uh, the program is building and uh, someone like Matt DeRoger, who's the coach there, has done a phenomenal job with his players. And then uh, obviously with you recording all the points that you do, I'm guessing it was always playing forward for you it was always about scoring goals what, what is it about scoring goals that you love so much oh gosh uh yeah that's kind of thing I do enjoy a lot uh um I don't know I think just you know I think everyone any hockey player will tell you there's nothing better than scoring a goal I think you know that's that's the end goal in the end right when you play hockey and um you know it's it's exciting it's uh it's fun I think uh you work hard for it right there's a lot of things that have to happen in order for a goal to happen and um, you know, it's a good thing that I had some good teammates over the years at Clarkson because, you know, I had a teammate uh, named Brittany Steiner, who was my, my line mate for four years. I'm pretty sure out of how many goals I had, she probably had, you know, 
90% of the assists, right? So it, it, there's a lot that goes into it. And I was pretty lucky to have some pretty great teammates. And is there a college goal that stands out to you in your memory as one that you look particularly back fond of? Um, I mean, I, I scored a goal in the national championship. I think that will always stick out. Um, but there is the, the one where I did break the record for the most goals. I think that one sticks out in my head. I think it was shorthanded uh, at home. And we had this horn that other teams hated, but we loved. And um, I still remember scoring and that horn going off. And, you know, I think that was kind of such a cool moment. I think I know I, I'm not a big, big one on individual kind of stats and stuff, but I think, you know, it's pretty neat to, to be a part of that. And um, that goal horn still sticks in my head and I wish I wish I could take it everywhere because it was really fun to score at home uh, at Clarkson. I refuse to believe that goal horn is not your text message tone. <laughs> it should be actually, it should be. <laughs> and then, and like you said, hockey players usually do not like talking about individual accolades, but they come along and you yeah. won, I'm going to butcher the name of this because I can never pronounce anything. You yeah. won the Patty Katzmeyer? Yeah, Kazmaier, you got it. Yeah. Kazmaier Award. That or is Patty a- Kaz for short. You can go Patty Kaz if you'd like. You won the Patty Kaz Award. <laughs> there you go. Oh. That must sound so weird coming out of a British accent. <laughs> <laughs> that must be, and that's for the top co- collegiate female player. That must yeah. be such a cool thing to win on, on a personal level. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I don't think I ever would have thought that would have happened. I mean, you look at the players that are in the NCAA, there's so many great players and um, I mean, that just capped off kind of the Frozen Four weekend. You know, I think um, at the Cause time... Because you, you get that before the final game, which adds pressure to you in that final. <laughs> it does. Like, so, you know, we, we win our first game and then the Saturday morning is when the brunch happens and they announce the winner. And, uh, you know, I think uh, that <laughs> does add a little bit more pressure. And, and but, bullseye. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, but it was, you know, I think the coolest thing where my, my parents got to be there and uh, all my teammates and... Honestly, right, a word like that doesn't happen without your teammates. So I think the cool thing was I could only, when I was on stage and giving my speech, I was so nervous, I remember, and I could, there was, the lights were kind of bright, so the only person I could see was my mom, and she's sobbing, and I was like, okay, I can't look at her anymore because I'm going to start crying, and, um, but the cool thing was, is, you know, I got to be there with all my teammates, and we still had, you know, we still had a goal, and, you know, in the end, right, we still had a game to play, and that was the cool thing is that, the goal was to get there, and then now, you know, the next goal was was still available. So that made it more special. And then when you when you look back at your time at Clarkson, what would you say the biggest lessons you learned were as a player and as a person? Um, I think the biggest thing was consistency. So when I say consistency, I mean um, in terms of, you know, your habits. Um, so we, being a student athlete isn't easy. I think a lot of people, a lot of girls that go into university, um, I, you know, I found, I found it hard the first couple of years. I had to figure it out as I went. And, um, you know, that, if that's anything I could tell any of the girls that are going to university as a student athlete, or it doesn't matter what sport you're playing is sometimes you got to figure out what works for you, what routine works for you. And, you know, it may take a couple of years to figure out, you know, to really get to where you need to be. And so my biggest thing was trying to figure out how can I be consistent in terms of my schoolwork and my on ice and that kind of stuff. And I also wanted to learn how to be a consistent teammate. So, you know, I was seeing these girls, you know, six, seven days a week. I wanted to make sure that I was the same person, no matter what kind of day it was. Right. I, if I was having a bad day, I wanted to make sure that, you know, I didn't bring it to the room. I wanted to make sure that the girls knew exactly what they were going to get from me every single day. And that's something that I learned big time there because without that, I don't think we would have been as successful as we were. And um, that's something that I st- I've taken into my routine now. And I think that's really important because, you know, there's, there's some times where you come into the room, some girls are going to have bad days. And if you can be the person maybe to bring that, bring it, bring them out of it, I think that's really important. And, um, you know, I, I learned a lot of my work ethic too from Clarkson. They, they have built some, you know, pretty great players out of that program. And the big thing is there, at least when I first started there was work ethic and you can, you know, you can be the most skilled team on the planet, but if you're not going to work and, and, and work on what the plan is, then you're never going to be successful. So that's something that, uh, that I learned when I was there. And what did, what, what did you study while you were there? What did you graduate in? I was a business major. Oh, okay. That's, it's always interesting to me what people study when they're at university. Yeah, they're, yeah. It should be me and nosy more than anything. <laughs> Clarkson is a big business school, so they, their business program is very strong. So that's why I took business. And then is it at that point you have the decision to pursue this professionally or go into, you know, quote unquote, a proper job? 
Yeah. So after I graduated, I was still a part of the national program, which was um, very fortunate for me. I was very lucky to be part of it. And so that was kind of my decision to say, okay, let's, let's go all in here and, and still, you know, go professionally. And that's uh, at that time it was a CWHL. So that's where I was fortunate to play for, for Brampton there. And um, you know, it's not an easy transition out of college, right? Cause everything's kind of laid out for you. And um, unfortunately in the women's game right now, or even, you know, four or five years ago, not everything was laid out. You kind of had to figure it out on your own and learn how to be a pro. But, and what I mean by that is you, you had to figure out what your routine was again. You know, you were a student athlete, you, you figured out your routine. Now you got to figure it out on your own as a pro. So that was something that, uh, you know, again, it was a learning curve, but something really, really cool too. And so if I'm correct, is the, the team you get drafted to in the CWH is based on where you like declare what area you're in. Yeah. So, so was, was there any chance you were going to move somewhere else or were you always just happy going to Brampton? Yeah. So essentially you kind of put down your kind of three, three choices, right. And um, so Toronto GTA area was, you know, kind of my first choice and it was either, there was two teams at the time, uh, Toronto and Brampton. So um, Brampton was the one that had, that had chosen me. And um, I think Montreal was my second choice. And then Calgary, I think was my third. And, you know, essentially, realistically, um, the way the women's game was structured, you can't really move girls around because if they had jobs or if they had, you know, other things that were going on in that city and they also wanted to play, you can't, t you know, if, they're, if you're not paying you, they can't move you around. So that's kind of how the draft worked. And um, that was kind of where I wanted to be. And it was also pretty close to home as well. So in terms of being from Ottawa, it was only four hours. So. And the really cool thing that ties in with your first year as a pro is that, that that's the first year you get exposed to playing with the national team at the senior level yeah uh, what well, now i've i've heard i've heard how interesting the selection process is for the olympics with this like bachelorette style system where you walk through corridors and rooms on your own at different times and things which is uh, <laughs> which i don't know why it's not a tv show but what is the selection <laughs> process like for the world championships so essentially uh how it works for so non-olympic years so so for example so we, we kind of work in quads, right? So we work year one to three is not Olympic year. And then year four is our Olympic year. So uh, my first year out of college was year one because the 2014 Olympics had just happened. Um, so essentially there's uh, two, two tournaments a year. We have the four nations cup, which is in November. Um, and then we have the world championships in April. And then we have for the women's team, we have September camp. So that's kind of our first uh, camp of the year. First time to be evaluated. Based on that, they'll pick a team for Four Nations Cup. Uh, and then we'll have another camp or a couple camps in between. And then they pick the World Championship team, which happens in April. So, uh, And then also during that, while you're playing with your club team, so for me it was Brampton, they'll, they'll come and watch you play, see where you're, how you're doing, that kind of stuff. They'll keep an eye on you throughout the year. So, um, you know, you kind of always have to be on because, you know, you, they're always watching. And um, so the selection process is – you know, it's, it's tough because you want to be able to, you know, you want to perform at camp, but you also need to be able to, you know, perform throughout the whole year, right? And then, like you said, that's year one of the, the, the system. Do you then, is the goal then for you? Because that, obviously the, the, the highlight of the women's game is the Olympics. Is that, yeah. is that what then you're, you've got an eye on that? That's what you want to make sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. That's, you know, you're kind of looking at it in four-year blocks kind of. And, um, you know, something that I did, I think um, – for my career, at least, I think I looked too far ahead too quickly. And, um, you know, I've learned that you got to kind of take either one, one year, or one tournament at a time and just kind of tackle that as you go. Cause realistically there's only 20, 23 spots. And, and for a forward, there's only 13 spots, right? So you kind of got to focus on what's happening in front of you and you can't look too far ahead because, you know, then it kind of gets away from you. Right. So, um, you know, you know, I, the one thing that I've learned over my career is to kind of tackle one thing out of at a time. And um, that's not very many spots for, you know, a lot of great players. So you got to kind of focus on, on what you're focusing on. And, um, you know, it, as the years go on, you, you realize how quick the quad quad can go. And all of a sudden you look up and the Olympics are almost only a year away. Right. So. Well, so I, I, I know how much like, things like that mean to, to players. Cause when I was talking to Megan, she obviously got dropped from the, the USA team, like just before. Yeah the Olympics and I know that that's what they worked was in like that like because paid like international competition in North America it's a very patriotic country Canada and and the US 
Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, for her, you know, I, I, you know, I've heard her story, you know, obviously we're, we're very close friends and it's heartbreaking. I, mm-hmm. I feel for her because, you know, I'm in the same position in Canada. We, we put so much work into this one tournament or for example, like world championships every year, we put so much training into this one event and, you know, to be, for that to be taken away from you is really, really hard. And, you know, you're, you're almost sitting there as an athlete, like, why did I do all this work then? Right. And, you know, I think, I think the biggest thing for us is just taking it one step at a time and not looking too far ahead and, you know, control what you can control. That's the biggest thing that I always say is because, you know, the moment you start thinking about things that you can't control, then, you know, it starts to get away from you. And do, just like the team Canada program have pay people to help you compress that and, and talk it out sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, they do. And it's, you know, you want to use, use those certain people that kind of lean on and, you also want to use your teammates who, who are in the same situation. Maybe you can talk, talk through with them or also even someone who's completely out of the picture, right? Sometimes you just need a fresh voice and um, someone who's not even right in the fight, right? And, um, you know, you want to surround yourself with people that are, you know, good, positive people. And I think uh, that's something that, especially right now, what's going on in the world, if you don't do that, I think uh, your days can feel pretty long. Now I'm going to skip ahead to the 18th of January 2015. Okay. This might be a date that rings that obviously doesn't ring a bell, but it's it's a date that's highlighted on your like All you right. I, I, know you, I know you've won the CWHL, but that's not on your Wikipedia. But this is. Okay. You had a fight in a game. <laughs> oh God. Now well. <laughs> now I think I don't think women's hockey gets the appreciation that it needs to. Like it is, it is still physical. It, yes, it's more centered on speed and skill, but it's still physical. Oh, but yeah. you don't see much fighting in it. So I'm going to need you to talk me through this incident in this eight nil win for your team. <laughs> oh no, we lost. We lost. Oh, it was eight nil. Oh, it's an eight nil win on your thing. <laughs> oh well, they, someone messed that up. But um, yeah. Just so played it with a win. <laughs> I mean, uh, the, so like you said, women's hockey. Like we're you know we're just as competitive as anybody, mm-hmm. right? So. Um, at that time, you know, at that year was not very good for, for Brampton. And, you know, we had gone through, I don't know how many, we had only won like two or three games, I think at that point. And, um, we were playing Boston who was, I think they had like 12 U S national team players. So they were, you know, the night before, I think we lost like 11, three or something. Like it was something silly like that. And the next day we played them again and we were losing seven, nothing, I think at the time. And, uh, you know, I, I think I went to go finish my hit. Like, like I usually do, right. I wasn't going to run anybody through the boards. I was just going to kind of finish my check. And, uh, she had happened to put her stick up and kind of caught me in the neck, whether she went to do it on purpose or not, I'm not really sure. But I, I remember I just snapped. I don't really remember. Yeah. And for those who know me know that I, that's not my type of game. And, I remember just being so frustrated with everything that was going on that I think I just took it out on, on that poor girl. And, um, you know, unfortunately it, it's forever documented on online, but you know what? I, I'm not really, you know, the women's game is tough. We're competitive and I, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it just shows that we're, we're trying to compete at just as much as the men. And you know what, why not? I think, uh, at that time it sh- I showed a lot of emotion and that's, that's exactly what was happening. We're, we lost, We've been losing and, you know, I, I don't like to lose. So that's exactly what happened. Now, the, the term on there as well is that that clip went viral. So, but <laughs> what is the reaction from your teammates and your coaches and things after that? You know what? I remember sitting in the room and I remember like I couldn't catch my breath because I, I was kind of like so hyped up and my coaches and teammates came, out, came in and said that was awesome because, you know, we were losing. We were losing 7 nothing, 8 nothing. We had lost 11-3 the night before. And for someone to actually show some emotion, I think is what people wanted and, I remember my coach coming, actually patting me on the back and being like, you know what? It's fine. You know, yeah, you got kicked out. Yeah, there was a penalty, but it's fine. You know, everyone, everyone's feeling how you are and it's okay. It's not the end of the world. And then does, does Brampton move, does, that, does it move to Markham or is it just a, a name change sort of thing? Is it, or yeah, is it a so, physical move? Yeah, so we actually made uh, the change uh, would have been... Um, 2017. 2017-2018 season. Um, they just, uh, I think the city of Markham wanted a team and uh, the mayor made, made the change and um, actually was a really cool thing to be a part of. I mean, Brampton was one of the longest standing teams in the city of HL, had a lot of history, a lot of great players came through that team. So I think the history there was tough to leave, um, but for the franchise and in terms of where we were going, it was a really good move. And 
Uh, Markham, you know, treated with treated us with awesome, you know, awesome amenities. We got our own dressing room. Uh, the mayor was phenomenal. Our marketing was awesome. Um, so it was it was a good move, I think, uh, and it kind of cool to be a part of a rebranding, right? And that was really neat. Well, I mean, the, the move certainly worked out. I'll say <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> so you do miss it now. You've obviously stuck with this franchise throughout. Was there any point, because at this point, the NWHL is now in existence. So yeah. Was there any point where you considered making the switch of league sort of thing? Um, no, not really. I think, you know, the tough thing was, was when the NWHL came into existence, they had promised all these things, right? They kind of promised the moon and all this money. And um, <clears throat> us as Canadian players, especially the national team players, we decided that we weren't going to go. We were going to stay in the CWHL and kind of stick it through and, um, all the American players went over to the NWHL. So there was a little bit of a split there. And then the competition kind of, not that the competition was still phenomenal in the CWHL, but obviously we don't want that to happen where there's a split. But mm. um, I never even thought about it because I had, you know, put at that time I had put enough time in with, with Brampton that I didn't want to leave them high and dry. And, you know, you kind of don't want to just kind of go where the, you know, where the light is or where the, the gold is. You kind of want to just kind of stick it through. And I'm really glad that I did. Well, sticking it, sticking it through, change of city, all worked out. You win the CWHL championship. That must yeah. be to, to win the professional. Like, see, now you've won the college championship and a professional title. That must be so cool. <laughs> yeah. So apparently I only play well every four years, but. Uh, <laughs> it's, but <laughs> so it's, coming, it's coming up again then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, four years from now. But, uh, um, that team was actually pretty similar. The storyline kind of to Clarkson in terms of when I first got to Brampton, it was, you know, we weren't the greatest. We kind of had some things to change up, things to do. And um, we kind of built this program in Brampton of, you know, really great people, really people that respected each other, that wanted, you know, respected what everybody brought to the dressing room, you know, whether you played two minutes or 30 minutes, it didn't matter. Everyone knew exactly what everyone was going to bring. And um, especially that season, you know, um, you know, we had at the time you look at the standings, we had no business winning that championship. We just squeaked into the playoffs, I think, on the last weekend of the season. Um, we were we played Montreal in the first round, which in my career we had never beaten in, in playoffs, I don't think, ever. Um, and you know, for those that play in Montreal, know how hard it is to beat them in Montreal. They have great fans, they're a phenomenal team. So that was awesome in itself. And then for us to get to the big game and you know, at that time, again, like at Clarkson, no one was going to beat us. We knew exactly, we were confident. We knew exactly what we had to do. Um, you know, I think that was pretty, pretty neat to be a part of. And the group that we had, again, just, you know, the girls that I still talk to and the girls that are teammates still now, are, it, it's a pretty cool experience. Well, it's the same in the, like the NHL. When you see the teams that like just squeak in, like the, the Kings, when they did it, the, the, their two yeah. championships, the teams that just squeak in often are the ones that make it all the way. <laughs> yeah. And we, you know, again it's kind of like the st louis blues like this mm. past couple of years worst uh, to first <laughs> yeah and we were at one point i think we lost like 11 games in a row uh and wow and and for uh, and women's hockey when you only play uh every every weekend or every other weekend or whatever and only play 30 something games that's a lot of games right and it can wear on you because that becomes one to two months of losing and that's a lot and um i remember actually it was in montreal right before Christmas, uh, we had taken them to overtime two games in a row. We, we still ended up losing, but that weekend where we traveled to Montreal and, and kind of bonded as a team, that was the turning point. And then whenever we got back from Christmas, I don't think we lost a game in regulation and we just hit the stride at the right time. And it's the same recipe for a lot of the championship teams. doesn't matter what level or what sport. If you hit the stride at the right time, you're pretty hard to beat. Now, my favorite thing about the CWHL, when I found out about it, about, less than a month ago, I would say, is the yeah. fact that there was a Chinese team in this league. But yeah. now tell me about your road trips to China. <laughs> yeah, so actually the cool thing about that is, you know, when they first came aboard, you know, the awesome thing was, you know, um, everyone was kind of like, what's happening? You know, what is this about? But the financial part of it was really big for the CW. We were able to do a lot more um, in terms of, you know, our league. And I remember the first trip, that year, um, it was, it was, it was one of the hardest weeks of my life. I remember, you know, you, you hop on a plane and you're like, okay, this can be okay. It's 16 hours. You sit on this plane, 17 hours. Um, we landed, um, where we all didn't know what day it was, you know, what, you know, and then within 24 hours, we had our first game oh. and we had, we had to, we were there for 
I don't know if we were there for a full week or close to a full week. And we had four games we had to play in, we had to play two different teams twice. So four games. And that was, and you're, you don't even know where you are. Your body is not adjusted. And it was a ton of fun. I would, I will do it anytime again with that group of girls, but it was hard, right? It, you know, you, your body's not adjusted. You have to figure out, you know, where you are. You're playing a, a ver- two very good teams at the time. And um, it was a ton of fun though, right? You, you get, that's where you get to team bond. You're, you, you know, and the girls that, um, so for the people who don't know about the CW, most of the girls work full-time jobs during the week. So at that time, when we went to China, those girls don't have to, they didn't have to go to work. Right. So it was a time where we could actually be a professional team and just hang out and go to practice, go to the games and just be a team. And I think that that's what made those trips really cool. And did you get to explore when you were out there or you were too frazzled because of the travel in the games? Um, we did a little bit. I mean, we didn't go uh, crazy far away because you know everything going on but uh, you know we, went, we did the you know like the black market and um, some of the markets and stuff like that we would walk around um, I know some of the girls went into Hong Kong and that kind of stuff um, but yeah some of it if you do want to kind of actually play well it's it's tough because you got to find a fine balance there well from, from talking to Megan from what I understand you did win most of the games when you went so we did. yeah we did we did most of the time most of the time yeah, so, you, so you found a good balance <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so, and then talking about Megan, she joins your team late on that year. Mm-hmm. Like she plays 10 odd games. She's just been dropped by that. From when I had on here, she credited Markham with helping her fall back in love with hockey. Yeah. Because what, 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 you, know, you bring in a USA international defenseman at that stage yeah. in the season. How much did that help you on the ice and in the room? Yeah, so um, actually I had, I had known Megan a little bit before that, but not, not well. Um, she had actually gotten in touch with me uh, after she got cut. I think it must've been a couple of weeks after. And I remember hearing the story being how I felt heartbroken for her. Um, and she had gotten in touch with me in terms of like training and that kind of stuff. And I said, just join our team. Just, you know, there's no pressure. Like who knows what's going to happen. We only have this many games left, you know, no pressure if you don't want to, but if you want to, you know, we, we've got a great group of girls um, and maybe you'll have fun, you know? And that was kind of the conversation we had. And she decided to join and it was, probably one of the best things for her I think individually you're right I think we had such a great group that just kind of welcomed her in and and knew that she was going to bring a really good element to our team and I think that's what kind of you know we made hockey fun it didn't matter you know at at some time we were not doing very well but we we were still having fun because we enjoyed going to the rink and, and being around each other so I think that's what Megan really got from it is that she enjoyed going to the rink again right I think sometimes especially when you're in that kind of environment in terms of trying out for an Olympic team or a world championship, it still is a competition, right? Cause you're still trying out, you're still trying to find your way. And I think that can wear on you as an athlete where you're just, you got to be on all the time, right? doesn't matter what you're doing. You got to be on. And I think she found a way to come to the rank and just have fun and play hockey. And that's why we, we play, right? We actually do really love it and, and we love it and have fun with it. And I think sometimes we lose sight of that and, um, that's something that Megan got to kind of find again with, with Mark. And I'm really glad that she did because it really became a really fun year. And I've got nothing but love for Megan on this side either, because she is helping me recruit people to come on this show. <laughs> She's, the best. So. She's honestly the best. So. <laughs> so then you win this championship in, in Markham. That, what was the final game? What was the final game? What are your memories of the game, of the game where you sealed the title? <clears throat> yeah. So we, um, we played at Rico center. So for, those are, I guess, in not we're in the UK. Don't know who the, what the Rico Center is, but it's where the Toronto Marlies play. So that's the AHL team uh, of Toronto, and it's a pretty historical building. It's actually been around for a long time, and um, it was pretty neat. We, you know, we got to show up and play there, and actually play right before the Marlies. And um, I remember before that game, I was a little bit nervous, but I wasn't too nervous. Like I knew that we had done all the work to to be where we were, and I knew that we were. I thought we were the better team. So if, as long as we did what we needed to do. We were going to win. And um, I remember going into overtime. So we ended up being tied and going into overtime. And I remember not being nervous at all. I remember looking down at Erica Howard goalie, who I've been teammates with for a long, long time. And she was laughing and joking. And I said, we're going to win. She, if you're, if your goalie is, is that comfortable right now, I think we're in a good spot. And everyone else, there was no nerves, like in the dressing room in between periods, there was, it was laughing and, and interacting and that's exactly what you want, right? You don't want to be nervous. You don't want to be silenced. And that's exactly what it was. And, um, you know, that was a ton of fun. I remember when, when Laura Stacy scored, I remember, I think I was the first one off the bench. I was so pumped and, you know, just kind of a cool, a year that for me individually too, I, I had been released from the Olympic team that, 
you know, a, a year prior to that, I think it just all kind of came together and um, it was kind of cool to do it with that group. And I really, really enjoyed it. No, so would you say that was the start of you playing your way back into national consideration? Because the next year you get back into that program. Yeah, that year, like, like, kind of like Megan's story, I just, I found, you know, I had to change what I was doing. I, my routine wasn't really working, obviously, like my mental side of my game, I didn't like it anymore. I, I, I did love hockey, but I, I needed to find something different. And um, after that, um, 2013, uh, sorry, not 2013, 2000. 17 year um i needed to reset and i changed my routine i changed where i was training i changed a lot of things in my in what my routine was and that's exactly what i needed and i started to love hockey again you know i started to love going to the rink and i had no pressure on me anymore i just all i had to do was play for for markham i had no pressure with the national team all i had to do was have fun and um that's something that really sparked me um again and um, you know, they were, they were really, the national team was nice to me in the terms of that, you know, they still kept me around in terms of, you know, they wanted me for the future. And that gave me a little bit of hope in terms of, you know, um, for the future. So I just needed to make the most of what my opportunity was in front of me. And that was, you know, trying to play my best with a really great group of girls in Markham. And, and for, fortunately for me, it, it really worked out. And then the instances like that can also like put a little chip on your shoulder, which can help as well. Cause it gives you that extra, you, you go that extra, 10 minutes at the end of practice you don't get off the ice whenever you, you like did that happen to you yeah it did I think um you know a lot of people that know me know me that I'm not really a chip on the shoulder type but um you know give me motivation it's like hey you know what they're still they still want you they still want you around find a way you know to make yourself you know available for them again make it make it so they can't say no to you that was kind of the big thing for me is you know um find find a way for them not to say no and I think that was the biggest thing for me is just work your butt off and you know and control again control what you can control and then you know that you've done all you can honestly and then at the world championships where you got back into the team you scored yeah. your first senior international goal so I did. you know I'm going to ask you to tell me how that went <laughs> yeah that was yeah that, I, I think it went off my leg, probably. I don't even think I hit it with my stick. The first one's but. never pretty. <laughs> no, but you know what? On the card, it still says one. So, yep. <laughs> you know what? Actually, that one for me. Um, um, Did you keep back, the puck? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, the, the big one for me, it just to get back, you know, back on that team was really awesome for me. And then to score a goal, it was like, okay, you know, I'm here. I'm here again. My confidence is kind of a little bit higher. And, um, you know, I mean, anybody who scores a goal for your country, it doesn't matter what sport it is or anything. It's pretty special and, you know, something I'll always remember. And um, I don't even think it was off my stick, but I'll take it. Well, that's the thing. Like, like you are, like, you're an offensive player. You score goals. So to do that, internet, that shows that you're doing your job at the highest level at that point. So, like you say, it's full circle. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I think at the time on the team, I, you know, like you said, I do like to score goals, but it wasn't my job to score goals. Mm. I, you know, I was just there to you know, bring whatever I could to the team. And um, I think that's also something that helped me is that there was no pressure for me to score or anything. I just, just go out and do your job. And, and honestly, it was able, I, it paid off, right. I was able to score a couple goals in that tournament and it turned out well. And then th th this is kind of like a roller coaster year. Cause you have, I don't know what, I don't know when this falls in, but yeah. the CWHL ceases to exist in 2019. Yeah, it, it dispensed. So was that before or after the World Championships? So actually, it was right before. So we were actually in Finland. Um, all the teams had just flown in. So we, we usually have a camp. We have a camp in North America. If it's if the tournament's in Europe, we usually have a camp in North America for about a week, and then we fly over uh, to get ready for the World Championship. So we had flown over um, that maybe a couple of days, maybe one day or two days before. The U.S. actually hadn't flown yet. They were actually still in the U.S., I believe. And the CWHL had called a, a conference call. So for all players to be on, which um, for us, we really thought it was going to be positive news because um, we had just come off a great year in terms of uh, revenue and visibility, like the TV ratings were high, um, all that kind of stuff. So we were like, oh, okay, maybe there's a new team. Maybe there's a new sponsorship. We all thought it was going to be really positive. And I remember getting on that call, the whole team was in the room and our GM, uh, Gina Kingsbury of the national team had her phone on speaker. And I remember um, Gina Hefford on the phone saying, you know, the commissioner of the CW saying, um, we're sorry to tell you that the, the league has folded. 
And I remember sitting in that room and you, and at that time there had to have been at least 18 to 19 girls on the national team that were in the CWHL. So that's a big number. And, you know, all of a sudden you could just, you could hear a pin drop. You could, the air was just sucked right out of the room because all of a sudden all of our teams, all of our, you know, plans were just gone. We had nowhere to play. We had no, nowhere to compete. And it was just like, okay, what do we do now? Right. It was, it was a tough, tough day. And we were also there, we were there to compete for an, a world championship. You know, we, that's not where our focus was. Our focus was, you know, with the national team. And then you just got to think back on, you know, all the people that it affects, you forget all the staff, all the, all the people that have run the league, all the people, you know, that are part of it. And it's just such a big hit. So many people at the same time that it was just a really hard pill to swallow. The, the, I can't imagine what that does to you mentally as you're preparing for a world championship as well. Cause that's the last thing you need to, before yeah. you go to international competition. <laughs> it was hard because a lot of the girls, you know, some of the girls had just signed leases in those cities. They, they had made plans to be there for a while and um, it was hard. We had to kind of, you know, I think some of the girls from our team and from the U S met and we had to put something out there um, together that were like, okay, this is what we're going to do right now. Let's put a kind of a cap on it and then we'll worry about the world championship. And then when we get back, we'll worry about this. Right. So I think that's probably the first time ever that um, Canada and U S had met before the world championship, right. You'd never catch us dead hanging out together. I don't think, but it was something that was bigger than just the world champ. It was it hit too many people and too many of our teammates and friends back home that we, we had to be able to come up with a plan uh, as a, as a player group, you know, not just the national players, but everybody together. And you mentioned a plan and there's always, there's always darkest before the dawn and, and all the cliche sayings that are actually really true out of this, yeah. the PWHPA is born, the professional women's hockey players association. Yeah. And you sign up with that side of things. Was there ever any consideration for you to go and play in the NWHL at that point? Or were you always going to stick with the group with what, what the plan was? Um, never thought, to be honest, it never crossed my mind. Um, the reason being is cause you know, we all decided that we were in this together and, um, I knew that there was too many people, too many great people in this group of, of players that what, that something's not going to happen, right? Like something is going to happen, whether it happens in two, three years or in 10, I want to be a part of that group that brings that together. And how powerful is that, that you have 200 plus of the best hockey, female hockey players in the world coming together and wanting this to happen. Right. So, um, you know, I wanted to be part of a bigger plan in, in the end. And, um, I think what we've done so far is really, really awesome. And it is pretty cool. It'll be cool in like 10, 15 years when I'm, you know, not playing anymore and all the girls are making a whole bunch of money and I can be like, you know what, I was a part of that. So. I would say, what was, is that why you did it? Like sign up with that? Is it the legacy side of things? Like, you know, to be on the right side of history. Yeah, I think, you know, as a, I'm, you know, I'm 28. I'm feeling like still I'm in my, young, still young, still young, very young. I still feel like I'm in my prime in my career. So you're, you're right in saying like, it'd be really easy for me to go and play mm. in the NWHL and play and play games and, you know, but I think for us as a group to make the sacrifices, it's not easy. It's not an easy thing to do as an athlete, right? You think you just want to compete and go, go, go. But the coolest thing is, is, you know, who it's going to affect after this, right? I think you, I, I, I'm fortunate to coach some girls here in the GTA and that's, the, that's who you're doing it for, right? The girls that are coming up. And so they have something to look up to. So they have a goal in mind so that when they're coming up through university and things like that, after they're done university, they don't even have to think they can go right into, you know, something that's, that's reliable and, you know, sustainable and something like that. But it's also the fact that when you, like I mentioned, I can't remember who I was talking to when I said this the other day, that when you look at the names involved in the PWHPA, yeah. that is important because names equal bums on seats to watch games, they equal eyes on TV screens. Yeah. So it's, to, in my eyes, it's only logical and only a matter of time before this whole thing comes together. But in the meantime, you go on this, is the Dream Gap Tour. Yep. How, how was that experience for you? So really awesome. So I remember, um, cause you travel around for this, don't you? Yeah. So essentially what happens is, you know, we've got different regions in North America. So, um, our big ones in Canada are Calgary, Montreal, and Toronto. So, um, you know, and then you have, you know, Boston, New Hampshire, different things in the U S different places in the U S. And, um, so basically what happens is, you know, these people sponsorships come on board and cities come on board and they say, I want to host a showcase. So they'll, have a certain amount of players go to that showcase, whether it be different teams or players or whatever they want to do with it. 
Um, so last year, um, we, I was able to go to a, a couple of showcases and it was a ton of fun. And I remember our first one ever was here in Toronto. And I think there were six teams, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I remember skating out on the ice. It was beginning of September. So pretty early in the hockey season, right? And I remember skating out on the ice and the whole rink was full. Like there had to have been at least, I want to say a thousand people. Um, it was I remember skating on the ice and being, this is not even a game worth anything. This is just a showcase. And it was so loud in there. And I remember seeing some signs on the, on the, on the boards that some kids had made been like, Hey, thank you for doing this. Thank you for letting my dream still be alive. Things like that, where you're just like, okay, I'm doing this for the right reason. And I remember skating around in warm up, just being like, this is the coolest thing ever. I'm part of this, this, this big thing that maybe, you know, in the end will be really awesome. And, and, uh, that was the first time that it set in that, you know, it's, it, this is going to be bigger than just me for sure. And then you can kind of see the momentum of it all. When you see that the PWHPA is invited to the all-star weekend yeah. and, they, and you don't get a showcase on a bigger, on a bigger stage than that all-star weekend, St. Louis. And I've watched the game two or three, every time I talk to someone who played in it, I always watched rewatch it because it's just fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but how yeah. cool was that to watch for you to see those girls in that environment and, and the, the stage that women's hockey was put on there? Cause usually you only get that at the Olympics. Yeah. Yeah, it was awesome. I mean, I, you know, I've played, I played with those girls. It was so cool to see. And um, I actually, it's funny thing is I was actually at Clarkson when we watched it, but um, like the, the, the skill and you could see it showcased right on, like everyone was pumped about how awesome I was excited, how awesome that game was. And yeah, it was only, I don't know, two 10 minute periods or whatever it was, but it was phenomenal. Like it was, there was, it was competitive. The girls were flying around, they were showcasing their stuff and um, that's how women's hockey is. I don't think people, you know, it, it's kind of sad to think, you know, in between the Olympics, you know, we need to remember they're we're the, mm. still the same players, right? We do play, you know, all the time. And that, that's the biggest thing that we need to get with this PWHPA is um, visibility and be like, hey, we're here. Come watch us. You know, we're, you know, the competition is just as good as, as it is in the Olympics. So and I think uh, that weekend was a big part of that. And you, 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 you see it with, with something like the, the first like major, like over here, like cricket and football are the two big things. Yeah. And then the two, like the first North American, like female league I was exposed to was the WNBA because yeah. they put games on Twitter and they had like a game on, and I watched it and I was like, Oh, this is, this is good. And I watched the follow the Washington Mystics first North American team I ever support that wins a championship. So <laughs> Love it. I was pumped. But when you see the relationship the WNBA has with the NBA, that has to be the goal with the NHL, doesn't it? That has to be the, you need that relationship. Yeah, I think, you know, I think that is what we need. And it's pretty cool to see, like, especially with WNBA and NBA, you see LeBron James and those big names wearing the WNBA logo. That matters. Right? It, it's huge, right? And I think um, that's all we're asking for as, as athletes. It does, you know, we want to be, we just want resources. We don't want millions of dollars, right? We know that, you know, it, it still needs to grow. We, we do know that, but um, we just want the resources. We want to be able to go to the rink and not worry about anything else other than practice or the game or anything. We don't have to want to worry about our equipment. We don't want to have to worry about our food. We just want to be able to be put in a situation where we can perform. And, um, and that's the biggest thing for us is, you know, I think we, our product on the ice is phenomenal from when I was in the CWHL to the PWHPA. It is absolutely amazing. And can you imagine how good it'll be when we don't have to worry about anything else? We don't have to worry about working full time or part time or anything like that. Can you imagine how good it's going to be? So that's all we're asking for is it's just a chance to have the resources to succeed. And, um, you know, I think we're going to get there and that's what we're trying to do here at the PWHPA. And like I said before, there's too many great people a part of this for it not to happen. I think that the biggest eye opener for me that, that completely took me by surprise when I was talking to Sarah Nurse, and she mentioned that you have to bring your own stick tape to the rink. And I was like, what? Like, yeah. Oh, in the British Elite League, you don't have to do that. So how does an international <laughs> Canadian player have to bring her own stick tape to a rink? That, that, that was to me, I don't know if it was naivety or ignorance, just not knowing that, that just bang to me, that was eyes open. Oh, yeah. That's the fight. That's what you're up against. <laughs> yeah, stick tape is a hot commodity in women's hockey. It's it's hard to find. And uh, actually, I think I went to Costco the other day and bought my own. But <laughs> it's exactly that's exactly what. So Nursey Sarah is you know one of my teammates, and that's exactly what she's getting at, right? We just want the resources to to succeed. And you know, I remember there's some stories. You know, I pack all my food when we used to go on road trips. I pack all my food and make sure that I'm set for the weekend because I don't really know what the plan is, right? Like. 
Um, we, we are very fortunate, like over the years, we, we, get, we get reimbursed and that kind of stuff, but we still have to go out most times and find it ourselves. So I, I used to just cook my food at home and just make sure that I was set so I didn't have to worry about it when I went on the road. And, um, you know, l little things like that, you know, it's not the end of the world. Like, hey, I still get to play hockey at, for a living, but it's just things like that that add up that will make our, you know, in the end, it'll make the product better. Now, you want to feel like a professional as well. If, you, if you're going to be described as a professional athlete, you should get everything that any professional athlete would get. Exactly, right? Like I, you know, even to this day, I, I, I get to train and play hockey every single day. And I'm so thankful for that every single day. And I'm lucky that I get to do that. But like you said, you know, it's, you know, I, I am a professional athlete, but there are times you're right that, you know, maybe sometimes I don't feel like it because of those resources. But you know what, it, it'll, it'll grow and it'll be a cool story in 10 years. I can tell all the girls that get it, you know, hey, remember that time where we had to bring all our own tape and food to the rink, you know? So, um, you know, I, you know, I will never take it for granted, that's for sure. And then the, the, the continued growth, like the PDUHPA is in its second year and you can already, like, you've already had the invite to the All-Star Weekend, it's already been there. And then I think it's last week, this secret deodorant deal yeah. thing came out. That, that just shows how quickly this is moving. Yeah, oh, that's huge for you girls. Absolutely. And uh, I think it's one of the biggest deals right in North American, you know, they've mm. shown for women's hockey and, you know, it just shows that people are interested, right? There's people around that want to see this succeed. And um, that's enough for me to keep pushing this forward because you know, there's enough people around that want to see it do well. And um, there's like, I can't say it enough that, you know, the girls that I get to play against and play with every day, phenomenal athletes, the skill level is off the charts and uh, we work too hard for this not to work. So I think it's going to be really cool when it does come together. Now, my, one of my favorite questions to ask people and put them on the spot is especially female athletes. Is, do you sure. ever see a future where, because seeing someone's face is very important to identifying with them, which is why yeah. I like things like this with like our players and other people, I guess the, you know, the, do you ever see a, see a future where female players don't wear cages? That's a good question. Um, Everyone I don't says know. that. It makes me feel so good. I know. I, it's <laughs> funny because I've had that question a lot. Like, would you wear a visor? Um, or a bubble? Yeah. Some of the girls do wear them. I, I just, uh, I've never actually really tried it, so I, I can't really say anything about it. But I would, I, I think you could see it eventually. Um, I, it would just look funny, I guess. Maybe because I've never seen it. But um, I think the girls eventually, I think you'd have to get used to it, right? I think the big thing for us, like, I would feel a little bit jumpy not having anything covering my face. And, but you talk to some of the guys, like some of the guys that I train with, they could never go to a cage, right? They, their vision is just so much better with the visor. So I, you know, I, I could, I could be into trying it, but I, I'd be a little bit scared for my teeth and my face if that was the case, but um, I could see it maybe over a couple of years. Maybe. Yeah. Who knows? Well, that's one of the things that I never took into, because I've never, I never played the game. So I've never took into consideration is when I talked to Renata, like she said, um, as a female player, you aren't used to, like, you're a bit more carefree with your stick because of the cages. So it would take a complete, like, like it's not something you think about, but you would have to retrain yourself, like, subconsciously to not be as carefree. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're 100% right. And that's, uh, it's actually funny because sometimes there's one time in a charity game I had played with, I can't remember what, he was an old, old NHL alumni, and I had went to go lift his stick, but I missed and I smoked him in the face. And you know, it wasn't on purpose, but like things like that happen, right? And I'm like, oh man, like, I mean, he was like, I'm sure that's happened to him a million times, but you know, things like that where we would, wouldn't be used to it. But I think if over time, maybe it could, it could happen. And um, I don't know, I, I think maybe we'll try it out. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> but it's like, uh, like Rebecca Johnston said to me, <laughs> like she yeah. says, I don't, she said, I don't think anyone wants to see women walking around with no teeth. <laughs> yeah. And my insurance isn't quite good enough for that. So. <laughs> no. So that, that, like I said, that kind of like puts a, it's not an in-depth look, it's like kind of a, a, a brief overview of hockey for, I, I'm going to butcher your surname, it's, is it yeah. Rattray, Rattray? I, I, Rattray, you got it, yeah, you oh, did good. pretty good, yeah, really good. I, the, when it gets to Canadian names and things, I'm a bit <laughs> all over oh, the show. You're good, that is really well done. Sometimes it, some, some, I get Rattray, I get, yeah, that's bad, but that was very good. But well, we had a player, who, I spent a whole year calling him Pither, and his actual name was pronounced Pither. So, and he never corrected me because Canadians are so polite. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said, that kind of puts like a nice, like, brief overview of everything. But if you had to look back at, at your time in hockey, is there a story from any level of it that you look back at and it just makes you laugh? <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, I don't know. There's a lot. I can kind of think. 
Um, it's always funny to put some people on the spot and then they just sit there for a minute in silence. I, <laughs> I know. Uh, I'm trying to think. Um, let me think. I mean, well, <laughs> actually one thing that sticks out to me. So I've been teammates with uh, Erica Howe, uh, Howie we call her. Uh, she's actually 13 years we've been teammates in a row, which I don't know if happens really ever in any sport. Um, so one, one year, I don't remember what year it was, must've been like 2016, maybe we were still playing for Brampton at the time. And we had just done a road trip, uh, back to Ottawa. Uh, our, we're both from Ottawa. So we had done like a, some sort of th interview in Ottawa for the Sens game or something. So we had to quickly drive to Ottawa. We had done it and then drove back. So that's it's four hours there and back. Um, sorry. So we, we had, we had driven there with somebody and then we had, taking the train back I'm pretty sure so on the way there Erica Howie had her keys in her pocket for her car that were um, that was back here in, in Toronto and they had fallen out in the car that we were in so we got to Ottawa and the car that we had taken already got went back to Toronto because she also had a quick trip so then we get on the train and we get back home at that time you know Erica she lived like 10 minutes from me so we always used to drive to the games together so the day before the game she goes I keep she goes, Ratty, I can't find my keys. I'm like, what do you mean you can't find your keys? Like, where are they? You know? And she goes, I don't know. Like, I, I swear I had them, you know? So I'm like, okay. Like, so I'm like, okay. So at the time I was looking up, like trying to figure out how we could get into her car. When in reality, you can just call CAA. But I, at the time I'm young and like not knowing that you can just call somebody to open the car. Right. And she actually had her skates in the car that was locked. Right. So her skates for her game, she's our, she's our goalie. So Think about having a goalie with no skates is pretty tough. So they're weird as it is. Weird, you're right, exactly. So so for some reason, like I had looked it up and I was like, we can't open your car, you know, whatever. So she's like, Okay, well, I have a new pair of skates. I'm gonna have to go get them molded and sharpened and we're gonna have to go to the game. So I'm like, Okay, fine. So I pick her up and she goes, You can't tell anybody. Like, this is a top secret. No one can know that I'm wearing a brand new skates for this game. So she ended up wearing the skates, brand new skates out of the box, never worn them. And we ended up winning that game. And now that kind of goes down in history of the story of she literally, but in reality, we could have just opened the car and it would have been fine. But at the time, I don't know why we scrambled to mold her new skates and, um, and, you know, get them ready for the game. But it was kind of funny. Now, I don't even think it came out till a couple of years later where people didn't even know she was wearing a brand new pair of skates. And for those people who play hockey, they know brand new pair of skates on a game day is not really that fun. So it's kind of funny that how it worked out. And it's kind of a bow on women's hockey in general that we just, we had to figure it out on the fly. So that was uh, one that sticks out and a good memory with Howie because we've been teammates for so long. And it's, knowing netminders as I do, having been around a few, it's a good job she didn't win in, she didn't get, she didn't get a shutout in those skates, otherwise she'd been buying a new pair every game. I, I know, I know. And it, the funny thing about Howie is she's pretty easygoing. She's not quite like all the goalies. She's pretty easygoing. So I think for her, it was just like, you know what, this is what it is. We're going to have to figure it out. So. And then an opportunity to name and shame here. This is always a fun one. Yeah. The weirdest pregame routine you have ever seen. Oh boy. Because there are a lot. <laughs> there are a lot of weird ones. Um, I don't know if there's any ones that really stick out to me. Um, or any that like caught you by surprise when you first saw them? Well, I had one teammate at Clarkson, uh, Shelby Nesbitt, who she used to sit on the bench. So um, she, we had a game clock. So in university and NCAA, every team in the NCAA, the same clock. So it counts down from 60. Warm-up starts at a certain time every time, so on the dot, and then the game starts, right? So she used to – our third goalie used to get ready, like, super early before the game. So she used to – Shelby used to sit on the bench in no gear and wait for our third goalie to be fully ready, and they used to sit out there for, like, five minutes, and Shelby used to run back in the dressing room with, like, five minutes to go before warm-up and get ready. And it used to give me anxiety because I'm like, oh, we only have like five minutes, right? So she used to run back in as quick as she could. And she was always on time. She was never late. Um, but that was, uh, I don't know if it's a weird one, but that's one that kind of stuck out with me that she never missed. She never was late. She always did it. She was rushing to get ready, but that was her thing, right? And that was uh, what made her get ready for each game. So 
Well, I cannot thank you enough for your time today. This has been, every, every time I have these conversations with, with the, the, the female players, it, it, I learn something new and I hope everybody else does. So, th so thank you, thank you, thank you. This, this has been brilliant. No, well, thank you for having me. This is awesome. It's always fun to talk hockey and especially Clarkson and Markham and I get to talk about some of my favorite people. So it's always been fun. Listen to the Nottingham's podcast, The Money Pot. The Money Pot provides information on the world of finances, from savings accounts to mortgages and money-saving ideas. We also have discussions about planning a better future, fraud awareness, plus top tips from bloggers talking about their home buying experiences, interior inspiration, plus much more. You can listen to the Nottingham's podcast today. Join Sam and Ross from the Nottingham Building Society and become a financial master. Listen today at thenottingham.com forward slash podcast.